Hi, my name is Ryan Lane and I want to talk to you about Muskrat Falls. There's been a lot in the media lately about the project and I think it's about time we got some basic information out there for people. So Muskrat Falls, it's a hydro project planned for Labrador which will deliver power to the island of Newfoundland. And some of the basic numbers look like this. Basically the construction costs in Labrador they're estimating to be about 2.9 billion dollars. The transmission lines down through Labrador and across the island they're looking at about 2.1 billion dollars and the subsea cable which will link Newfoundland to Nova Scotia will be about 1.2 billion dollars so the total cost for this project they're looking at or what they're saying now 6.2 billion that's billion with a B which means nine zeros now of course not all of this cost is to be borne by the province of Newfoundland and Labrador there's a deal struck with Amero which is the energy corporation for Nova Scotia and their portion is going to be 1.8 billion dollars and they're going to own the subsea cable and some of the transmission lines on the, on the island of Newfoundland. So the portion for the province of Newfoundland and Labrador is 4.4 billion dollars. That's what we as taxpayers, rate payers, will have to pay. And that's only for the capital cost. That's the building of the uh, infrastructure itself that doesn't include any maintenance costs into the future. So you might ask, well why do we need to invest 4.4 billion dollars uh, into a project like this? And I'll give you an Alcor's rationale. They're basing it on two main pieces. They're saying first of all that they've done energy forecasts into the future, uh, use their crystal ball, and they say that by the year 2019 the power demand on the island of Newfoundland will actually have reached a point where we can no longer meet it with our current uh, energy production. So we will be uh, needing more than we're currently producing. That's the first thing they forecasted. The second thing they forecasted is that based on that need, they did an analysis of two particular approaches. One was Muskrat Falls, and the other was an on-island solution, which included a couple of small hydro projects and some other things. They forecasted into the future the cost of those two projects up to the year 2067, which is quite a ways off. And based on those numbers, they're saying that the Muskrat Falls project is the cheaper route of those two to meet that demand. Now, one thing you have to remember is that the rationale for this project doesn't include selling power to anywhere else. They're saying there will be extra power that we can sell, but the main reason that Nelcor and the current administration wants to push forward on the Muskrat Falls project is because they forecasted a need and that Muskrat Falls, they say, is the cheapest way of meeting that need. So, I think it's about time we started looking at those main rationale, looking at the project as a whole, and really trying to figure out if this is something we should be getting behind or if this is something we should be running away from. Okay, so the first thing we need to talk about is the power demand forecast that Nalcor has done. They're saying that our demand is going to increase over the next number of years, and like I said, by 2019 or so, we're not going to have enough power. They're saying that that demand is driven by two things, a number of issues, but two main things. One is that the new home construction in the province, obviously mostly in the Avalon Peninsula, uh, those new homes are being built with electric heat more than any other source. And that, of course, is causing a demand on the system. The second thing that they're saying is going to cause an increase in demand is the development of the production facility, uh, the nickel processing facility uh, at Long Harbor by Valley Inco. Now, that processing facility has been in the works for many, many years, five, six years for sure. So back during that time, of course, there were other big demands on the system as well. The mill at Grand Falls, Windsor, for example, was still open. And that, that facility used a great deal of electricity as well. So if you're Valley Inco and you're going to build a facility uh, in Newfoundland, you can't help but look at the system and one of the things you have to consider is your electrical needs because that facility will have significant needs. So at that time, five or six years ago, they would have been looking at the system and saying, is there enough power available for our requirements? Now, if they had determined back then, with Grand Falls Windsor still open, that there wasn't enough, they would have never agreed to build a plant. So now that Grand Falls Windsor is offline, then you have to wonder, where is this additional demand? This company, Valley Co., has determined that they're going to build a plant here with incredible uh, electrical needs, but yet they've determined that they're not concerned about the power supply here. Otherwise, they wouldn't have invested the millions of dollars that's required to build that plant. Now, something else we have to talk about is the, the facility at Holyrood, the generating facility. Now, Holyrood was initially developed as a backup system 
uh, so that when we had increased needs during the winter months because of heating and so forth that it would kick in and supply those extra needs now it does it can run other months of the year but that's generally when it kicks in now the interesting thing about Holyrood is that the operational cost for Holyrood over the last number of years has actually decreased it's gone down despite the fact that the cost of fuel per barrel has gone up and that's happened because we're actually relying on Holyrood less and less seems like a funny situation as a matter of fact when I attended the Nalcor AGM this year um, they put up a graph that indicated their their forecast and the previous usage for the island portion of the province in terms of power demand and the graph showed that approximately in 2011 we were using the same amount roughly of electricity that we were using in 1992 to 1995 roughly around 7500 gigawatt hours so I can't help but wonder how accurate is this forecasting model that they're using to figure out the demand in the future and as a matter of fact when Ed Martin was on open line with Randy Sims as a, as a guest I called in and I asked Ed Martin what is the margin of error or the accuracy of this power demand forecast that Nalcor has developed because he said they did it in-house he couldn't answer my question and that's unfortunate because that's one of the answers that we really need okay now we need to talk about the second part of this if you follow their logic that uh, that the demand is going to be increased to such a point that we need a new supply of energy um, the second part of their rationale states that Muskrat Falls is the cheapest way of doing it as a matter of fact they call it the least cost option that's the words they're using uh, now at 6.2 billion it doesn't sound very cheap quite frankly uh, and the one thing I was wondering is does that 6.2 billion account for the potential cost of overruns because you have to remember that projects at this scale that get uh, that where the construction lasts multiple years overruns are actually pretty common if you take for example the construction of the sewage treatment facility in St. John's that project went significantly over budget and they had to go back for more sources of funding so just for example if a project that's 6.2 billion dollars goes 10 to 20 percent over budget where's that extra money going to come from that's significant significant uh, increases in the cost the other thing is that 6.2 billion seems a little conservative to some for construction of a project at this scale older this is not the first time that Muskrat Falls or, or Gull Island or the lower Churchill has been talked about as a project and in past years the estimates for co uh, for construction were not too far off this 6.2 billion number uh, now this is many years later yet the cost doesn't seem to have increased too much that seems kind of unusual as well and definitely worth having a look at as a matter of fact the term sheet that Nalcor has signed with Amira specifically states that with regard to the subsea cable piece if the cost of construction of that subsea cable goes more than 20 percent over budget there's actually a mechanism for renegotiation to see who covers what who pays for what so if that's written into the contract then you have to assume that they're expecting some overruns as well now the other thing is that they're only considering Muskrat Falls versus one very specific island option where they've determined all the criteria and again you know it includes some hydro and some wind but it's not exactly or doesn't seem to be uh, very open to different alternatives now what they say is that between the Muskrat Falls version and the island version the standalone island version there's a two billion dollar difference uh, up to 2067 so again that's well over 60 years of forecasting that's going into this now I have serious issues or concerns with economic forecasting costing of projects that uh, that look over 60 years into the future and again when Ed Martin was on open line I called in I asked him about the accuracy of the forecast for the costing of these projects I asked him about the margin of error and again he didn't really have an answer for my question and that's that's unfortunate too okay so now you've got the rationale that Nalcor is providing uh, why don't we talk about some of the things that hasn't that, that haven't been really talked about or haven't been considered at least not publicly anyway uh, not by Nalcor and not by the current PC administration and the first thing which is a real big one is recall power on the upper Churchill we actually have the ability to recall some of that power back for ourselves for our own uses and we've had a couple of people come forward in letters to the editor describing how this is possible uh, but yet 
when Nalcor and, uh, and the current administration talk about it, they say how complicated it is and how unlikely it is and that sort of thing. But quite frankly, I for one would like to see that as a possible option if we're talking about spending $6.2 billion. A little complication might be worth the effort. Uh, the other thing that, uh, that we haven't spoken about a great deal of, or that people haven't talked about, is the potential expansion for wind and hydro projects. Small scale hydro and uh, possibly larger scale wind projects. This would definitely involve some sort of energy capture uh, system because our biggest demand is in the winter time and we would need to be able to store some of this energy in some way uh, for times when the wind isn't blowing or the rivers are frozen or something like that. And in a recent letter to the Telegram, uh, a gentleman wrote in and talked about how other countries are doing this very thing. Countries who use wind as a major source of energy have storage, energy storage capabilities and that's certainly not beyond something we could look at here but yet we're not. And the other thing uh, that has sort of been glossed over a little bit is with regard to Holyrood. In the past, uh, one of the issues that was talked about in terms of fixing the pollution with regard to Holyrood was retrofitting it for a natural gas uh, situation. So it would burn natural gas instead of burning Bunker C, which is a very uh, thick, dirty fuel. It's cheap, but it's not very good for the environment. So back not long ago, Nalcor was talking about we could retrofit and burn natural gas. It would take a little bit of money, a bit of investment, but it might be worth it. Now, all of a sudden, that option has been completely removed from the table since Muskrat Falls has been introduced. So now, natural gas at Holyrood, not an option anymore. Not entirely sure why. They're saying cost, uh, supply issues, that sort of thing. Seems kind of funky to me. The other thing that hasn't been talked a lot about here is the home production of electricity. In Ontario, for example, they have a program whereby if you invest in small-scale electrical generation projects at home, like a small windmill or solar plan panels or something like that, there's a bit of incentive. And what happens is if you produce more than you use, it gets sold back to the grid so that other people can use it. Now, obviously, not everyone is going to do this, but maybe some people would, especially if the incentives were right. That's another option there that has not been considered. And then finally, perhaps the biggest one that isn't being talked about at all, is energy conservation. We have not heard anything whatsoever about conservation efforts from the current administration or from Nalcor. If we have a significant demand issue, then let's talk about how we can manage it a little better before we start spending $6.2 billion. Conservation is the way to go. We could look at energy efficiency here in terms of regulations for new home construction, in terms of regulations for industrial use possibly. Who's to say? But there are definitely options out there. I mean the big switch now from uh, old school Christmas lights to the new LED Christmas lights, that kind of stuff makes a big difference or it can make a big difference if everybody got on board. So why are we not looking at more options? If Muskrat Falls is going to cost us 6.2 billion, maybe there's some other things we should be looking at. Okay, so now, back to the costs. This project is going to cost $6.2 billion. So the, the question, of course, that everyone asks is, who's going to pay for it? And the answer, unfortunately, is going to be that we are, as ratepayers. Now, Nalcor has pretty much said that by the year 2017, which is not that far into the future, our energy costs, as, as ratepayers, uh, is going to increase by 37% without uh, Muskrat Falls. Now, on the other hand, they're also saying that with Muskrat Falls, our energy costs are going to increase by 37%. So they're saying that with or without Muskrat Falls, 37% more is what you're going to be paying on your home bill. It seems kind of convenient that with or without we're paying the same amount. I don't know. Um, but basically, right now, in terms of your home bill, you're paying roughly about 10 cents per kilowatt hour, a little more, a little less. Um, but with Muskrat Falls, when that goes online and the costs of that all trickle down to the ratepayers, we're talking somewhere in the neighborhood of 14 to 16 or more cents per kilowatt hour. And that's only the wholesale price. That's what it costs to get the electricity from Labrador to the distribution system in Newfoundland. On top of that, then, you're going to pay an additional fee to the a uh, company that delivers the power, which of course in a lot of cases is Newfoundland and Labrador Power. Now they have their right of course to take their little bit off the top, they supply it directly to your home. So then you're talking another increase on top of that potentially 16 cents per kilowatt hour. 
Now basically what that means is that if you have a light bill right now that's about $200, you could be looking at a light bill that's $300 or much more, depending upon uh, the specific cost by the time it arrives to your door. Now of course that only means, that only includes uh, the situation if the estimates that they've used are accurate, which again we're not really sure, and it also doesn't include any cost overruns on the project. So let's just say that this $6.2 billion project goes over by 20%. Guess who gets to cover that extra 20% costs? You do. Okay, so the other thing we've got to talk about is this deal with Emera and Nova Scotia. Now, they're investing $1.8 billion into this entire project, which is mostly for the subsea cable, but also a little bit for some transmission uh, lines on the island. Um, basically, what they're getting for that $1.8 billion is free power, a certain amount of free power, for 35 years. That's a pretty good return for them, actually, because what's going to happen is they're going to take that free power and they're going to sell it. They're going to sell it in Nova Scotia and uh, potentially to some of the other Atlantic provinces, but it'll, I'm sure it'll mostly be in Nova Scotia. They're going to sell that power for somewhere in the neighborhood of seven to eight cents per kilowatt hour. And even if it goes up and they sell it for nine cents per kilowatt hour, whatever the case might be, they're getting it pretty much for free. So here in this province, we're looking at estimates between 14 and 16 cents per kilowatt hour, and that's at wholesale. Nova Scotia, they're looking at costs seven to eight cents per kilowatt hour. Even if that's wholesale, you're still talking a pretty good deal. So imagine yourself as a, a business investor and you've got a project, a business you want to get on the ground somewhere. It's going to require significant energy supplies. Now, if you're going to build a business that requires energy, would you build it in Newfoundland and Labrador where it costs 14 to 16 cents per kilowatt hour for power? Or would you build it in Nova Scotia where it requires half that, seven to eight cents per kilowatt hour? Doesn't seem like a complicated decision to me. And I'm sure that investors will, will do the same. The other thing to talk about is the potential for power sales through the system, through that subsea line uh, of our power to the New England states, which we would, of course, gain revenue from. So the issue there is a couple of things. First of all, uh, the markets haven't been identified. There's no real way to understand uh, or to, to know, sorry, specifically what those markets are because we haven't identified any yet. And as a matter of fact, uh, recent in the media, they've been talking about some of the New England governors talking about, look, we're, we need a bit of power, but we're not sure you're the best option. We're not really sure the transmission capability exists. We're not really sure that this is going to happen when you get things up and running. So there might not even be a market. And even if there were a market, the rates would be similar to Nova Scotia. So basically, we would be selling that power into the New England states somewhere in the neighborhood of seven to eight cents or nine cents per kilowatt hour. Whereas back here on the island of Newfoundland, uh, rate payers are paying 16 cents per kilowatt hour. So the same electricity that is pr uh, produced in Labrador would flow to the island and rate payers all over the place here would pay possibly 16 cents or more per kilowatt hour. We would take that power, ship it down to New England and sell it for eight, nine cents per kilowatt hour. And that's basically one of the arguments uh, that people are bringing up as being unfair. It seems ridiculous for us to produce energy and sell it to ourselves at twice the cost that we're selling it to other people. It just doesn't make sense. The one last piece to talk about here is the review. Uh, people have been requiring and demanding of government uh, and of now, of course, saying, look, if you want us to believe these numbers, we need an independent audit. We need an independent review to take place so that we can have faith that your numbers are accurate. So what they've done is they've gone to the PUB and the PUB has engaged Manitoba Hydro to do a review of sorts. The problem with this review is that the scope is too narrow. It is only given the choice basically of saying, here's option A and here's option B, here are the numbers, which one suits us best? Which one is the best choice? Now, option A of course is gonna be Muskrat Falls, option B is gonna be the standalone island option as specifically delineated by Nalcor. So we're not talking about any of those options that I mentioned earlier. None of those will be talked about here. This is very specifically one option that Nalcor has uh, described. So the results that come back, you might as well say they're a foregone conclusion. They're going to be in favor of Muskrat Falls.
because they don't consider the alternatives and the options um, with the other potential options. Or, and I, as far as I understand, they're not going to be exploring the forecast in terms of demand either. We're just assuming that the demand will exist. I don't like that assumption very much. And quite frankly, I'm not very happy about that particular review, and I don't think it's going to be an overly useful exercise. Okay, so that's some of the information about Muskrat Falls. Certainly not all of it. There's a ton of stuff out there. Go to the Nalcor website, read everything you possibly can. You have to become informed about this if you're going to make a sensible choice, uh, because basically this is going to be a key election issue come October. So there are a bunch of questions being asked. We've got former government ministers who've asked some pretty pointed questions. We've got former bureaucrats out there in the media who are talking about this. We've got former board members of Newfoundland Labrador Hydro asking questions. But more importantly, we've got regular citizens, people who are looking at this deal and saying, this doesn't make sense. It doesn't add up. And they're all asking a bunch of questions, and quite frankly, the answers, they're not coming. At least not the ones we really need. They keep saying, least cost option, least cost option. Show up. Show us the numbers. Let us decide for ourselves if this is something we want. I mean, why are we not talking about energy conservation? Why are we not talking about the accuracy of the forecast, both for the power demand and for the costing of the projects? Why are we not talking about the other alternatives that are out there? And the, the most important question is, why do they think that the people of Newfoundland and Labrador, specifically on the island of Newfoundland, are willing to invest $6.2 billion in a project that we might not even need? That's the important question. If you want to know more about me, check out my website, uh, www.bonavistasouth.com. I also write a blog, uh, The Rural Lens www.theruralens.com. Again, my name is Ryan Lane.